We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovex. Joining me today is David Jensen, mining executive and metals analyst. David, thanks for joining me again today. Really appreciate you coming back uh, after the excellent, excellent discussion that we had about two weeks ago here. Thanks, Tom. It's great to talk again. After that last conversation we had, which um, listeners can go back, we went through a lot about how the bullion banks might be facing, well, not only the bullion banks, but the exchanges, a lot of these different entities are possibly facing a shortage in the metals that can actually affect the delivery, the pricing, all of this right now. I wanted to have you back to answer some of the some listeners' questions. And we, we're also going to go through a lot of the mechanics and let's say size of a lot of these markets. So maybe let's start by talking about the the size of the London market right now and how much of the global gold trade actually occurs in the city of London at this point? So the estimates are that roughly 91, 92% of uh, global gold trade happens in London. What happened in 1986 was that Bank of England uh, was given oversight and regulatory authority over the uh, London gold and silver markets, which are the dominant gold and silver markets uh, in the world. And we can talk later about the details of that, but essentially what happened was that they uh, approved the trading of these unallocated gold contracts in lieu of trading uh, segregated and allocated bars in the market to have a true price discovery in terms of supply versus demand. Mm -hmm. The market was transformed into really a price setting mechanism as opposed to a price discovery mechanism. And the way that you can do that is that you can create unlimited supply of gold and silver with these unallocated contracts because you don't have to have the actual metal to provide supply of investment product into the market. Investment houses and pension funds, et cetera, are holding uh, these spot contracts, which are notionally good for bar delivery in London on a local plus two, what they call, so essentially a three-day net until you get the bars in your hand. What that did then was that these unallocated contracts substituted for the ownership of specific gold and silver. And so along with the expansion of claims in the market, there was also an expansion of volume in the market. We're now seeing 200 million ounces, as mentioned the last time we talked, that there's 200 million ounces of gold traded per day in London and 2.92 uh, billion ounces of silver traded every day in London. And that's when we use the, the 10x or the 10 times multiplier that, that the uh, uh, LBMA uh, stated in their, uh, what, what they called the local London liquidity survey of 2011. It's a bit of a mouthful. But they surveyed traders and, and two thirds of the traders responded how much they were trading in these over the counter markets, which, which are the big markets in London. Mm -hmm. And so we have this enormous churn of paper and paper, not just the trading, but actual paper supply in the hands of investors who think that they're actually owning gold and silver, which they're not. They're owning claims on, on bars of gold and silver. And the, um, the Bank of England and the LBMA say that they are merely unsecured creditors, which I don't think many of them fully realize. Mm -hmm. so, so the size of the London market now has grown uh, to being $500 billion of gold being traded every day. And people always talk about, oh, you know, the, the oil market is by far the biggest commodity market and it dwarfs gold. Well, oil is less than $100 billion a day of trading in New York, which is the biggest uh, uh, oil market in the world. So gold in London is five times larger than the oil trade in New York, which is the dominant market. So that's that's the critical issue that we have. And given these tremendous issuance of these promissory notes, in the market, the question is, you know, how much silver is there actually being claimed in the market? And that was the thing that stood out to me so much was that, you know, silver in the vaults in London is only three and a half percent of the gold in the vaults in London. 
and half of the silver. So in round numbers, about 800 million ounces, 823 million ounces of uh, silver in the vaults in London. And about 500 million of that is supposed to be uh, owned and held by ETFs. Mm -hmm. What we have in the end then is that we have a, a 10 times multiplier on the on the daily net settled contractual trade in London. The amount of claims in the market is two to three times the daily volume of trade. If we look at that 2.92 billion ounce market and we multiply that by two, we get roughly five and a half billion ounces of claims and take 90% of that, uh, which is in, in these uh, spot contracts. So in round numbers, we have about 5 billion ounces of silver claimed in London. And that using a, a higher multiplier of three times daily volume, uh, being the open interest or total number of claims, we have a little over 8 billion ounces of silver claimed in the market. So this so far dwarfs both the annual mine supply and the acknowledged you know, there might be of the order of the order of three or 400 million ounces in the market that aren't claimed by ETFs. My sense is there might be 50 million that's not allocated and segregated in the vaults. And against this, we can see that we've got in round numbers, five to eight billion ounces of standing claims in the spot market. And that's the killer is that spot market contracts are immediate ownership on demand by the holder. Just to right. clarify, where does that take place? Like, is that in a in a particular market? Is that a particular contract in London? Where does that spot market, you know, have to deliver that metal, and and where is it exchanged? It can happen anywhere. Uh, the contracts are OTC, so they're specific to the tr two trading parties. Right. Um, but it says right in the the the, the terms of these uh, air quotes regulations in 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 London, and we can talk about the regulations later. Mm -hmm. But it can it can specify delivery anywhere in the world. So that so, really seems like the physical delivery is really the linchpin to this entire market, is it not? It is. It, it is what unravels any Ponzi scheme is when somebody tries to get out of it because you have pyramided claims into a Ponzi scheme. And it's it's exactly how this system is set up. It's a pyramided claim, which it relies on everybody sitting frozen in their chairs and not realizing that these you know perfectly good pieces of paper that they hold are <laughs> only that. Yeah. Right. They're promissory notes to deliver something. And you're unsecured when you hold this contract. And so they they trade this absolute blizzard of paper in London every day. And it makes absolutely no sense unless you understand the fact that it's not meant to be real, that it's not real. It's a substitute. It is it is basically it is a price setting mechanism as a as opposed to a price uh, discovery mechanism. Mm -hmm. Price discovery needs supply and demand balance for you to figure out how much the market needs. Price setting, you have to be able to supply enough to satiate the market, you know, to the level that you want it to be satiated. And I think that's this is the big thing that people are waking up to. And I, I think that's why, you know, all of a sudden these bullion bankers are showing up, uh, are, are showing up in Shanghai. They they are starting to see demand now for delivery in all the trading centers in the world because we've got this 260 million ounce silver deficit this year. And we've, over the last five years, we've had a billion ounces of total deficit in the market. So has this mechanism of being able to almost in some ways virtually trade silver, has it made a, has it made it a, a virtual asset therefore? It, it, exactly. Because when you hold a unallocated contract that's unsegregated in in the vault in London. That can be the claims on on that metal can be created without limit, mm -hmm. and so you don't hold anything in particular. You just hold a claim against somebody who has promised you something. And as I as I just said, it's just the trouble comes when people say, "Okay, well, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take you up on your promise." Mm -hmm. And then when you've got this amount of of leverage of five to eight billion ounces of open interest claims. I think using quite moderate multipliers um, in that market, it gives you an idea how tenuous the balance in this market is. Mm -hmm. And then and then back again to that point that you've got only three and a half percent of the dollar value of vault metal in London is silver. It's tiny, tiny compared to gold. Yeah. So what does that then mean for the open interest? And what does what did May and now obviously going into June, what does that look like? 
they they do not publish the specific open interest in London. This is the problem. It, it is an opaque market. It's overseen since 1986 by the Bank of England. And they've been okay with the fact that you you cannot see you know details of the of the nature of the trading in that system. We do not know specifically what the open interest is, and the open interest is the standing claims in that market. Mm-hmm. We do not know that. We do not even know specifically what the daily trading volume is. They give you an an average uh, trading volume net settled per month, and that's net settled, meaning you know the purchases. Uh, minus the sales, right? They give you the net settled contracts, and so, for instance, if you we talked last time about if you 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 buy fifteen and sell ten, that they say you've only traded five contracts. Well, you've really traded twenty five contracts, right? And so we're stuck with this, you know, this twenty eleven local London liquidity survey in gold to estimate exactly how high the volume is. Number one. And then number two, we have to estimate the number of open claims in the market or the open interest in the market. Mm-hmm. The big problem with that, the survey from 2011, was they only had two thirds of the trading houses respond. And we don't know if JP Morgan and HSBC and Standard Charter, you know, the big trading banks, Deutsche Bank, if they even responded. Mm-hmm. And so if the big players aren't responding and you're saying, well, we're doing 10 times the daily trading volume of the net settle that we actually post, but you only use the smaller trading houses, you could have 20 times or 30 times uh, leverage in the markets in terms of actual trading volume versus the the, the stated net settled. Mm-hmm. That's one problem. And the second problem that we have is that we're scaling. We're, we're using a two to three times daily volume to estimate the number of standing claims in that market. And that's just, you know, using typical commodity ratios. We don't know specifically. It could be many times that or it could be a fraction of that. This is the uh, the problem with having an opaque market that's run like that. Yeah. And uh, it's okay with the Bank of England and it's, it's okay with the major bullion banks to run that way um, because I think it works in their interest. And the reason I believe that it works in their interest is because of Gibson's paradox that we know from the 1970s there was a high rate of inflation, prices rose to a high level, and gold and silver absolutely flew. Now, Gibson's Paradox, and this was a paper uh, analyzing this, was a paper was written by Larry Summers as well. So it's not something that's obscure, but it's the fact that the interest rates follow the price level, and they don't follow the rate of inflation, the average percentage rate that year-over-year prices are rising. So with, with, with Gibson's Paradox, it indicated that for centuries, the analysis had shown that uh, interest rates are set by the price level and not set by the year-over-year rate of price increases. So if the price level is high, it would it would uh, uh, speak for or speak to there being high interest rates. And that makes sense that if the price of gold is high and the price of silver is high, it means there's high demand for these metals. Mm-hmm. And if there's high demand for these uh, monetary and savings metals, it means there must be less demand for other things like bonds. If you have a low demand for bonds, it, it means that you have high interest rates mm-hmm. because you have to raise interest rates high enough to get people to go into bonds. Looking at it big picture wise, the Bank of England uh, is in the business of uh, running monetary policy and setting debt levels. And for more than 40 years, the major central banks have run a sequence a sequence of investment bubbles, uh, which has been very pleasurable for those who hold assets. Um, and they've done that by using in- increasingly loose monetary policy and, and increasing debt levels. Mm-hmm. So we've now got 340% of uh, debt versus GDP on a, on a total level in the US versus a historical norm of about 150%. To, to get back to your original question, that it is in the interest of the banks who benefit when there is investment bubbles and financial bubbles. And it's in the interest notionally of the central bankers to uh, run a big party with public being none the wiser. And the best way you can do that is by essentially shooting the canaries, which are uh, uh, of, of loose monetary policy, of excessively loose monetary policy. And those two canaries are gold and silver. So in some ways, are they running this system the same way they run the banking system in the way that they use this fractional reserve lending where 
the the bank doesn't necessarily have the amount right. of currency available right. for all the claims on it. Is this is this very much the same thing? Yes, it is. The ability now that's that's held by these bullion banks and and uh, uh, indirectly by the central banks is that there can be as much uh, gold and silver issued into the market as you want through these promissory note contracts, these promissory note spot contracts that are traded in London. It allows you to flood supply, artificially flood supply into the market of this paper metal. Mm -hmm. That would depress the price. It's like, oh, you need metal here. How many hundred million ounces do you want? Okay, done. Mm -hmm. Right Now that works tremendously as long as the metal is not, try, people don't try to extract the metal from the system. Yeah. But we have shortage. And so that's happening. And that, that's why I think we're seeing uh, bullion bankers that all of a sudden, you know, want to travel east. Right. And we talked about that last time. Mm -hmm. So, David, how did the LBMA come to have this power basically bestowed upon them? Well, the, I, I put out an article on my Substack a few days ago about that. In 1986, there was the Financial Services Act that was created. Um, and it was passed through the, the UK Parliament by the, and, and originated in the Thatcher government. And with that, you know, with, with that new legislation, the Bank of England was given oversight. And, and if we if we look at the Bank of England's uh, uh, trade paper, which is the Alchemist, and we look at uh, issue number uh, 68, we can see in there that the, the founder chairman of the LBMA, he's writing a congratulatory letter to the LBMA uh, on the 25th anniversary of the LBMA's creation. And he states in there, um, and this is a quote, he said, you know, the eventual outcome was that the bank, being the Bank of England, assumed formal supervision of foreign exchange um, and bullion markets uh, in, in England, you know, and, and where the, you know, again, where the, the bank refers to the Bank of England. So he says that in 1986, so the FSA uh, legislation was passed in, in, uh, in mid-1986. And a guy says, he says, in October 1986, I wrote to all the associate members informing them that I had been asked by the Bank of England to give some thought to the organization of the market, being the gold and silver market, in light of the forthcoming enactment of the Financial Services Bill or the Financial Services Act. What he got back from those bullion bankers who were uh, trading in London was recommendations for a regulatory document uh, to regulate their trade. What they got out of it uh, what was generated in the end after review um, by the Bank of England uh, was this London Code of Conduct for Non-Investment Products, or NIPS, N-I-P-S. Mm -hmm. And this Code of Conduct, which was generated um, by the LBMA, was a was a voluntary code of, com of compliance for the traders in London. So we see that the Bank of England uh, was given oversight uh, and regulation of this market, and they respond by regulators drafting their code of conduct, their own code of conduct. And then the code of conduct in the end is a voluntary code of conduct. No one is being held to any standard of, of activity at all. Mm -hmm. And we can see that in the in the Alchemist's issue number, I think 59, came out in January or July 2010, pardon me. Um, and that was written by Joel Cook, who was the, the head of commodities compliance at Standard Chartered Bank, which is another one of the big British banks. And he said compliance with the NIPS code, for example, is essentially on a voluntary basis. And he says that right in the Alchemist magazine. Out of all this as well in the NIPS code came the fact that they defined settlement of the trading of these uh, contracts and it said that settlement or payment for a transaction will generally be in U.S. dollars over an account in a New York bank. And then he said that uh, it says that uh, delivery of metal against transactions can be made in a number of ways, including delivery in a vault of a dealer or elsewhere by credit to an allocated or unallocated account with the dealer or through the London Bullion Clearing in an unallocated account of any third party. And then they define these unallocated accounts. This is the this is the rub. This is the central part of this. It says the balance of an unallocated account represents the indebtedness between the parties, and credit balances on client accounts 
are backed by the general stock of the bullion dealer with whom the account is held, the client in this scenario is an unsecured creditor. So that's from that's from page 38 of the NIPS code that that the uh, that they use to regulate the markets in London. Final point about this, Tom, is that the these NIPS uh, you know regulatory documents aren't even available on bank on the Bank of England website mm -hmm. or on the LBMA website. It, it was dug up by, by Bullion Star. Okay. In in uh, a Singapore uh, um, um, metals company that, that buy and sell gold and silver and, and do really good uh, research into the markets, so they've posted the regulatory document uh, on their website, but you cannot find it anywhere on the actual websites of the regulators themselves. Whether that the whether that is the LBMA or the ultimate oversight body, which is the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. So why is it a voluntary? set of rules set of regulations well if you want to create gold and silver without limit then you don't want to put any limits in there mm. i think that's the ultimate answer tom and then it, it's just, regulation it's regulation in in name only it's regulation without regulation mm -hmm. well as you said this is i think you titled the article something like who watches the watcher right this is Right. If 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 they're if they are making this quote unquote voluntary step and they don't want to abide by it, it's yeah. it's just seems like a completely arbitrary piece of paper at that point. Right. And this is, you know, it came it came into being in 1986, the Bank of England's oversight of the of the metals markets. And 1986 is very close to 1980, which was the top price in gold and had risen in the prior nine years by 21 times. Mm -hmm. Still very fresh in the minds of these central bankers. So just to, I guess, crystallize this a bit more, what is the definition for settlement of a gold or silver contract according to this code? Well, I'll, I'll read verbatim from the NIPS code and it says, I'll read that once more. It says, uh, it says settlement and delivery the basis for settlement and delivery of the local London quotation is for delivery of a standard good delivery bar at the London vault nominated by the dealer who made the sale. While settlement or payment for a transaction will generally be in US dollars over an account in a New York bank, delivery against transactions in gold and silver are made in a number of ways. These include physical delivery at the vault of the dealer or elsewhere, by credit to an allocated or an unallocated account with the dealer or through the London Bullion Clearing to the unallocated account of any third party. So it's it's either metal or it's a promise for metal. That's your settlement. Right. There are other exchanges that are able to settle in cash. Is that right? Uh, yeah, primarily futures markets. Mm -hmm. But we know, for instance, that the that there is a spot market in Shanghai in which you cannot issue in the Shanghai Gold Exchange, in which you cannot issue a contract for gold or silver unless you have a, a specific bar that's been through their refinery to assure the the uh, the grade, the purity, and it has a laser etched serial number on it that is that is issued by the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Mm -hmm. And that market trades in the order of about 330 million ounces, or sorry, 330,000 ounces of gold per day. Um, that was a number from last week. Mm -hmm. 330,000 ounces of actual gold bars traded in an entire day in Shanghai. Compare that to 200 million ounces of gold traded every day uh, in London. And there's just no comparison. Mm -hmm. You're talking about one six hundredth the amount of gold is traded when you're actually trading physical bars, right? So then, you know, we're just talking about the difference between Shanghai and London. What is the difference between London and the New York markets? Well, the New York market is primarily futures, and futures are typically never meant to um, deliver bars. They're they're a hedging mechanism. Mm -hmm. 
when you look at the COMEX, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange now owns the COMEX and the trading that goes on there, you'll see the, the trading activity for uh, months in the future. And so that's not a phys- that's not meant to be a physical market. It's a futures market. The real market is the cash market. And the the world's cash markets are absolutely dominated by the trading in London. And I think it could be materially more than 90% of the world's cash trading of gold and silver happen in London. We just they just haven't disclosed the numbers um, you know, with any specificity. They've given us an approximate number of ounces that trade there per day. And the scale absolutely dwarfs the trading that we see elsewhere in the world in the cash markets. Mm-hmm. Do you think the fact that New York, as you said, is a more of a hedging market because it's a futures market, does that explain this behavior of if you would have sold the Asian clothes and bought the New York open over you know this last bull run in the metals that you would actually be down like because of that mechanism and and the the role that that market serves yeah do you think that explains that behavior yeah when new york is open the the markets you know the cash markets globally are definitely impacted by the trading that goes on there in that market so yeah it it does make sense that to, it that that would have an effect on the price or that, that has driven the price down because Again, they're untethered in the New York futures market in terms of you're not trading bars, you're trading promises for bars, and then you're only having to deliver the bar if somebody demands delivery. And then when you look at the actual regulations of the COMEX, there are three or four different rules in the rule book that allow forced cash settlement at the discretion of the directors of the COMEX. Mm-hmm. So they, if you have a contract, you say, well, okay, I, I have a, a June contract, I want delivery. They can say to you, we're going to enforce a cash delivery provision here. It might give you a premium, but here is the requirement because we think it's in the best interests of the market. Mm-hmm. And you know, looking back on, on silver now, it's interesting that note um, that was put out just a few days ago, uh, June 3 by Michael Lynch. And he's got um, the website econanalytics.substack.com. He notes in the in the June contract that you know we're into the we're into the delivery period now, but leading up until the delivery period, there was uh, what was it like? There was four days for a four day period between the sixth and the third day to first notice. He says that twenty two percent to forty two percent of the open interest vanished overnight each day so from day to day 22 percent to 42 percent of the claims disappeared when they reopened in the morning Mm -hmm. and this is due to this cash settlement provision we just don't know whether it's being driven by uh, inducement you know offering people extra cash or if it's being uh, driven by coercion Mm -hmm. all kinds of forms of that Um, or if it's being driven by notice um, from the directors of the comex we don't know but that's a non, typically a non-physical contract, although there are provisions for taking delivery. Um, but it seems that you can only take delivery um, if it's comfortable for the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had Michael on the show a couple times, and um, yeah, his his analysis is uh, is interesting. I, I really I, I like his analysis too. The key for me though is the size of the london market it absolutely dwarfs anything else on the planet mm-hmm. and this is the market I mean, we can look for indicia in in new york in the futures market but i think it's the spot market in london that we've got to keep an eye on and i think the flat lining of the silver vaults there that they um, haven't been drawn down any, uh, very much in the last three or four months is an indicator now that there's stress in that market and that there's difficulty sourcing the metal mm-hmm. And certainly with the run on metal in, in China that we've seen, and the fact that we know that there's a large global deficit of silver. So a, a deficit means that it doesn't come out of recycling and it doesn't come out of mine supply. It has to come from people who have stockpiled refined bars, these 1,000 ounce uh, refined bars of silver in vaults. So that's what you need to do uh, to fill that gap. And so 
uh, this year they need 260 million ounces, uh, plus or minus. It's estimated to come out of these refined bars from vaults. And, you know, we've seen silver run up from 22 to 32 bucks an ounce recently um, since uh, mid-February. And I think that's that's the indication there that they're having trouble drawing these bars out of the vaults and they're they're going afield now to try and find the bars that they need to satiate the market. Mm -hmm. The risk is though, of course, that this whole ball of string comes unwound in London because of the shortage. David, you mentioned earlier this kind of relationship between the ETFs and the exchanges or the or the bullion banks. Like, do you have any views on how much physical silver the ETFs really hold? Do we have any transparency to understand that? You know, here, here's the here's the challenge is the fact that you know you can audit silver holdings if you're an ETF, you can have them audited. Mm -hmm. But there's there's no way of one either verifying the honesty of the ETFs in terms of rehypothecation or the claims that they allow to exist on the metal that they own. Number one. Number two is that sub custodians. Not, I, I read the SLV ETF practice, um, and it seems to uh, indicate that there's not a full audit for the sub custodians. So you have custodians and sub custodians who hold the metal. Mm -hmm. So that's a second venue for which that metal can be held in an unallocated form or have multiple claims against it. Yeah, so the, the issue with ETFs, um, and, the, and this goes back to Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs saying that the ETFs rehypothecate or, or sell their metal or claims on their metal into the market. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, no way, there's no way to ensure how many claims there are against the ETF metal there in the vault. So that 500 million ounces that's in London, you know, it could have 8, 10, 15, 20 claims against it. We don't know. Mm -hmm. And then secondly is if you read the SLB ETF prospectus, uh, I dug few, through that a few years ago, and it seemed to indicate that the uh, sub custodians, so the sub custodians are vaulting services that hold metal for the custodian of the ETF of SLV, that they could, that there was a provision in there that they could hold unallocated uh, contracts in lieu of bars. So we really don't know uh, with the ETFs, um, you know, how many times they've uh, sold claims on the metal. And then who their sub custodians are, and if their sub custodians actually do hold the metal, or if their sub custodians hold the promissory notes. So, I mean, you look into these numbers; it's there's no definitive answer in terms of the leverage. But you know, when we can see approaching three billion ounces traded every day, and five to eight billion ounces in in uh, indicated open interest in London, you know, versus like I I I, I sincerely think that there's. 50 million ounces of silver that's not claimed in the London vaults. And I think they've had that pulled down. Um, they've, they've had that eaten into and that they're scrambling uh, over to Asia and other places trying to find replacement silver. So we'll see. Yeah, again, I think this is, we can do our best to understand this opaque market. We can do our best to try to analyze all of these different situations, but you or I don't have a crystal ball, number one. Number two, we also, it is going to take time for a lot of these situations to play themselves out and to, to actually present the problems and the inefficiencies within the market. There's a lot of people I know that would love to see this just come crashing down with a bang, but I don't think that's necessarily, A, what's, what's going to be best, <laughs> obviously, for everyone. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, having some honesty, transparency, and some actual discovery of where this metal actually lies and how it's being rehypothecated and or traded, some clarity to that, I don't think would be a, a horrible thing. No, I mean, for a, for a market economy, which is the most productive economy uh, ever conceived, for, for the market economy to work, you need price discovery. And you also need fair measure for exchange. Historically, Wait. that was a form of gold and silver money. And um, and exactly to that point, you know, if if your basically your your backstop or the 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 value of a lot of 
the rest of your economy basically rests on the value of gold and silver as you as you stated earlier we need to know what that is actually worth and how much there is and who holds it as well yeah if, if you it? if you want to hold a financial market party and you want to create an a seemingly impossible economy they, i mean the articles in the wall street journal in the 90s about the great moderation and how brilliant greenspan was uh, with his methods if you want to do that you have to you have to take away fair measure from the market so that you can generate cash and you can generate these bubbles number 1 and then number 2 is you've got to take away the price signal that gold and silver are giving you because they are they're the tattletales on loose money and it appears to me that both of these things were done and we've uh, lived through this uh, you know kind of a magical uh, mystery age uh, of everybody's a millionaire or plans to become a millionaire and you need, just need to have a house and you just need to own the s p 500 and hold it for 20 years and and everything is fantastic mm -hmm. And um, the the only reason that the London market is opaque is because the bullion banks wrote the regulations with oversight of the Bank of England. So the bullion banks wanted an opaque market, which is what we essentially have. And the bullion banks wanted that, and the Bank of England want that. And that's why we have it where it is today. Now, whether it unravels quickly, or slowly, like I don't think, like I view this as fraud. What's happening in the markets is fraud. They were set up to be fraudulent markets. And I'll probably disturb some of the listeners out there because of the, it certainly disturbed me, let me put it that way, when I started to uh, twig on to that. Mm -hmm. But these markets are markets that give us fictitious pricing. And the mechanisms that have been used to give us fictitious pricing appear to me to be unraveling. Now we get war in Ukraine and and uh, the city of London uh, operatives like Boris Johnson and David Cameron and all these guys uh, pushing for war. And we get COVID and, uh, you know, panics about COVID and lockdown and money printing. And now there's a, a and there's going to be a panic, I'm sure, about bird flu. And it just goes on and on uh, in terms of the distractions. But I think no matter what happens, it, the truth is going to be known as as it always is. So the question is just how much time. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's unfortunately this, this all takes time just as many of these, many of these revaluations, many of these shifts in the market, whether that be westward to eastward with new currencies or pricing taking over of pricing mechanisms in the gold and silver industry, all of this stuff takes time. It's not a, you know, a binary event or a momentary event that happens and then everything is different thereafter. It's, there yeah. is no A to Z. There's all of the letters in between that, um, you know, have different ups and downs to them. The, the, the challenge though, is that um, if you look at criticality theory and, and criticality theory is a, a feature in nature where things, when they fail, they tend to fail suddenly. Mm -hmm. An example of that is an avalanche. It can sit, you know, an ice shelf can sit mm -hmm. for months and months and months. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's there's a, a sound is made and it sets off an avalanche, which thunders down the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's how um, fraudulent markets typically resolve themselves. They don't typically resolve themselves in kind of a, a happy uh, meandering fashion. And I think there, I think people have a sixth sense, like they know something just does not add up, and on so many different levels, um, in in both North America and Europe, like things are completely out of whack. And I think people are figuring that out, and that they're starting to move into these uh, safe haven assets, like uh, you know, physical gold and silver metal. Even seeing Costco now, right, selling bars and coins of gold and, uh, uh, of gold and silver. And that's that's a great thing, but it's also an indicator that this is becoming, um, at the margins, is becoming a, a mainstream phenomenon. And I think that that issue is one that the, the guys sitting in the city of London, I mean, the Bank of England's in the city of London, and the LBMA is there, and the banks that are trading there are there. And that square mile, they, they've got to be sitting there looking at each other, thinking, hey, what are we going to do? 
because of the scale of what they've done. It's I I can't think of a bigger a bigger fraud in history that's happened once we understand the impact on interest rates of creating fictitious pricing for gold and silver and ultimately the consequences of this artificial economy and market that has been created i just can't think of anything that even compares to the scale of this mm -hmm. and the discussion is getting quite widespread now it's not just uh guys with tinfoil hats discussing it it's guys like reading the documents in london and saying well what do you mean you gave oversight to the Bank of England. And what do you mean that it's self-regulating? You created regulations, but they're voluntary. And, and what do you mean that they're trading gold and silver and that they're that that they're promissory notes? And and what do you mean you're trading 200 million ounces of gold a day in London when 120 million ounces are mined globally every year? And and how can you trade three billion ounces of silver a day in London? when you're when you're mining the like 830 million ounces a year like it just right it, it, it you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist or, or somebody who's mentally unstable you just have to have a guy that reads their documents and then says i have a question i just i'm wondering if you can answer this question mm -hmm. well that's the thing is you see the scale of what is being traded versus the underlying asset and then the voluntary requirements to follow these regulations on top of that and it it always comes back to the idea of incentives okay who who do who do both of those facts ends up end up serving and and why and yeah. you know those those shouldn't be hard questions to answer yet they end up being masked in this opacity of how these markets have been built over time right and always keep in mind that they're trading five times the amount of dollar value of gold in london every day that they're trading of oil every day in new york mm -hmm. it gives you an idea that this is a very important market it's not about earrings and nose rings <laughs> right <laughs> it's, it's, it's about something else <laughs> Absolutely. Well, David, I think that's a, a good good spot to kind of wrap up on. Again, we got a lot of excellent feedback on the last interview, and it would Great. be, you know, we'd be happy to answer anybody's questions on any of this stuff. If we need to do a round three, um, we'd be happy to do that as well. But I really appreciate your time and you staying on top of all of this stuff. Of course, you write lots of articles at jensendavid.substack.com where you post all of basically articles about all of these things we've been we've been touching on and, and talking about. Thank you, Tom. It was uh, it was good talking and and um, yeah, this is appears to be the quickening, so it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds. Absolutely, David. We'll we'll speak uh, again shortly. Thank you very much for your time. Sounds good. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.